I didn't need to say anything. Um, welcome. We are, uh, as you can tell by the hush, we're about to get started. So hope everybody's found their seat. Um, just a quick programming note. This is the uh, talk about the history of zoning. Uh, this is not the Cambridge Science Festival. That's happening upstairs on the ground floor. Uh, we did try to get this included uh, in the Cambridge Science Festival. We told them that zoning is a science, but they weren't really convinced by the evidence, so we're down here in the basement. Um, if you weren't intending to come to a talk about the history of zoning, um, definitely you're welcome to join us. Uh, so stick around, but we won't judge you if you decide to sneak out the back at some point. Um, taking things in, in kind of a, uh, a different order than uh, usual, I just wanted to start by um, shouting out uh, my own team, uh, the zoning development group in the community development department, because really none of this would be possible without the efforts that they uh, made over the course of the past year. Uh, in fact, it really was a, an effort and an idea that was cultivated and promoted by uh, the team as kind of a, a grassroots effort. I, it was something that we had been thinking about for a while, you know, as we started to look towards, you know, well, 1924 was when the zoning ordinance was adopted. You know, should we be doing something to, to commemorate the, the zoning centennial? And, um, you know, I wasn't really sure if that would be a fun thing to do. They really pushed me along to do it. Um, in thinking about what we wanted to do, the first obvious idea was Black Tie Gala. Um, the budgeting for that was a little bit difficult, so instead we decided to do something a little bit more, um, a little bit more of an informative kind of retrospective uh, about the uh, past hundred years. And we're doing a few, there's a few different parts to that, which I'm going to talk about. Um, but it's actually really an interesting time to be doing that. I never thought that um, when we were thinking about the hundredth anniversary of zoning, that uh, zoning would be coming up this year as a Real, as a campaign issue in a presidential election. I think it tells us a lot about um, how zoning has really captured people's attention recently. Um, so as part of this zoning centennial effort, one of the first things we did was spend some time researching and digitizing the historical zoning records that we have in the city. Um, so if you go to our website, which we set up a kind of a convenient um, link to, um, and maybe you've already done this, uh, we've created an archive where you can download and view zoning maps and ordinances from key points in time over the past hundred years. And uh, this actually involved more work than you might think. Uh, and maybe this is something only for the true zoning nerds out there, like myself. I'm Jeff Roberts, the Director of Zoning and Development. Why did I forget to introduce myself? Um, so uh, it was also something that was really helpful to us because as we started putting together some of this other material, it was important to be able to build this resource that we could um, look to. So the second thing, which is very exciting and kind of a, a news flash as of today, is that based on this historical, historical information and with help from the Cambridge Historical Commission and the GIS department, we've been working on a series of what's called story maps. Um, which are interactive multimedia narratives that give a little bit more insight into what was included in those different um, stages of zoning in the city and providing some context around uh, how those different zoning changes took place. So just today, we launched the story map for the 1924 zoning ordinance. Um, more chapters are going to be coming out in the future, highlighting different stages in the history of zoning. Um, this is all linked to that web page that was on the previous slide, so stay tuned there if you want to see more. Also, if you subscribe to our This Month in Zoning newsletter, this is our uh, little monthly newsletter that we put together with kind of what's happening in zoning in Cambridge. Um, we also will be highlighting the, some of the information that comes out there. So if you're, if you're subscribed to that, then um, stay tuned. Um, so those pieces are uh, important things that we've been working on, and tonight we have something very special planned, something we've never really done before. Uh, we've brought together five people with special expertise in the history of zoning, some within Cambridge and some outside of Cambridge, and we've brought them together to help us reflect on how zoning has evolved over the past hundred years and what that's meant for the evolution of Cambridge and even the rest of the United States over the past century. Um, so uh, here are the panelists. I'll just introduce them quickly, and uh, they're all kind of sitting in the front. They're all going to give a little introduction themselves, but maybe they can kind of wave um, as I introduce them. Uh, first of all, in alphabetical order, Les Barber, um, one of the more elusive figures in, in the world. There's no, no photo exists of Les Barber, apparently. Um, 
Uh, but he served, yeah, but Les uh, served as, the, who many of you know, served as the director of zoning in the Cambridge Community Development Department for three decades, uh, from 1981 to 2001. Uh, when, he, when he retired, he still lives in Cambridge um, and incidentally taught me everything I know about zoning. Molly Brady uh, is the Louis D. Brandeis Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. She teaches property law and related subjects. Um, and her articles have won uh, many awards, which we have listed on our website, and I, I, won't, uh, I won't name all of them. Amy Dane is an independent, research, uh, independent consultant and uh, researcher in public policy. Um, one of her uh, recent reports, uh, or one of her more recent reports, maybe your most recent report, is um, called Exclusionary by Design. It's about the history of zoning in the Boston suburbs. Um, and she's also done, uh, many, um, done many reports, including the state of zoning for multifamily housing in Greater Boston, um, and worked with various uh, think tanks and organizations in the area. Um, John Infranca is professor of law at Suffolk University uh, Law School. His teaching and scholarship focus on land use regulation, affordable housing policy, property theory, law and religion, and election law. Um, and his work has focused on uh, the intellectual and legal history of single family zoning, the role of administrative discretion in land use regulation, and he's currently the lead researcher for the zone, uh, Massachusetts Zoning Atlas. Um, and finally, last but not least, our, our very own uh, Charles Sullivan uh, has been the executive director of the Cambridge Historical Commission uh, since 1974. Uh, and he's the co-author of many books, including um, the very exhaustive Building Old Cambridge Architecture and Development, which is very helpful for us in um, putting together the information for this. Um, and he's lived in Cambridge since 1965. So here's what we'll be doing today. Uh, first, I'm going to give as brief an overview as I can, which may not be all that brief, of how Cambridge's zoning has changed over the past 100 years. After that, I'm gonna turn it over to each of our panel members to introduce themselves and reflect on one thing that they find particularly interesting or relevant about the history of Cambridge's zoning or just zoning in general. And after those introductory remarks by the panelists, I'm gonna moderate a discussion among them, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, we will plan to wrap up by 8 p.m., but we hope that you can all stick around afterwards for, for some mingling and some re light refreshments that we'll have out in the hallway, um, but we do need to clear out of here by 8.30 so that the good people at the library can uh, close up the building. So um, as we get to the questions, um, I'll have a few questions of my own to kick off the discussion, but we'd also like to get some suggestions from the audience. So if you have a phone on you, you can use this Mentimeter link to send us questions. Um, I believe there is a link, uh, limit of one question per person on that, so just keep that in mind. Um, and we also have some old-fashioned uh, paper and pencil that you can use. So um, we have some, uh, some of our staff members are stationed in the back, you can see. Uh, Daniel over there from the zoning and development team, Swathi over there who's waving. Um, and uh, they, uh, if you kind of put your hand up and wave to them, you can uh, get some, some paper and pencil and you can start thinking about your ideas for what to ask about. Um, as a small side note, just to acknowledge a, a kind of a, a bit of an elephant in the room, I'm sure that many people in the audience are aware that the city council is currently considering proposed changes to the zoning ordinance. Um, this discussion, we hope, will help provide some, some context as uh, the city thinks about what kind of future changes might be considered. Um, but I would like to avoid asking the panel about that because that wasn't really the topic of, of this meeting. We've been planning this for a long time. We weren't sure that it was gonna coincide so, so closely with, um, with an effort like this. We haven't prepped the panelists on exactly what is being proposed at this point, and I don't wanna get ahead of any future public meetings or public hearings or conversations about that in the future. So just keep that in mind in thinking about questions. Um, so I am now going to give a overview of zoning. Um, it is, uh, I'm gonna do this in two different ways. And the first is a, a very brief overview, which I call history of Cambridge zoning in pages. Um, so uh, this is an at a glance overview of how Cambridge zoning has, has evolved just in terms of like the size of the ordinance and in the number of pages. Cambridge zoning has always been pretty fluid. In the past hundred years, it's been amended about 300 times. 
and those amendments include small changes, but there's also been about every 20 years um, a big change in zoning, not necessarily by design, um, but because there seems to be kind of a natural generational break around that time where you know people start to kind of reevaluate and rethink um, the direction of zoning. Uh, our respective, or I'm sorry, retrospective looks at the zoning um, at all of these key points in time, and I'm going to talk about them individually in a second. But just starting by looking at the overview, um, you see something that started in 1924 really is an element that grew out of the building code, um, then emerged as a standalone zoning ordinance in 1943, and in 1961 remained a fairly kind of simple and straightforward uh, document, wasn't particularly length lengthy. And then from the 70s to the present grew to become increasingly longer and more complex as it started to include a lot more special provisions, which I'm going to talk about a little bit. Um, but notably, it's about 12 times as long today as it was in 1943, um, although I like to point out it's now available online in an accessible and searchable format. So you don't need to carry around a zoning ordinance the way I used to when I started working here. Um, What's interesting to me is that the increased length and complexity of the zoning ordinance has coincided with increased growth in the Cambridge population as well as the Cambridge economy. So as the zoning ordinance has become more complex, it hasn't necessarily um, uh, had a, a negative impact on how the city has grown or developed. It's been you know, more about finding ways to refine uh, and direct that growth. So the second piece, we're going to look, um, and I think this is kind of the maybe the showpiece of, of this piece, is we're going to look at maps from each of these different points in time and talk a little bit about what they say about the city's development and what people's thinking was. Um, so one thing I'll point out actually before I start into this is that as you could see from the hallway where we um, put out some of these historic zoning maps, um, Cambridge, like, like film, or Cambridge's zoning, like film and television, was originally not in color. Um, and one of the things that we did as part of this exercise, which I think we, we have um, largely our, our interns to thank, Grant and, and Mary Lou help with this, and if, if they're your students, um, they should get an A+, plus, uh, if any of your professors are there. Um, they helped us to actually put together and, and colorize uh, the zoning map so that we can actually go through iterations of the map at different points in time and the colors will help us see how um, different things have changed. Um, and and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but in 1924, Cambridge was in a, a phase of population and economic growth. Um, most of the land in Cambridge by this point was developed, so when zoning was put in place, the effect of it was mostly to control how land would be redeveloped in the future. Um, the zoning at this point was fairly simple. There were unrestricted districts in purple. They're labeled U. Um, those allowed any uses. There are business districts in red, which are um, under the code B, which allowed everything but industrial uses. And there are residential uses under R and that are in yellow on this map, uh, which allowed a broad range of, of residential types of uses as well as things like churches and, and other things that you might find in, in residential neighborhoods um, and schools. Um, so within each of these types of districts, there were four building categories. There was a category of one, which allowed up to 100 feet of building height. Category two allowed up to seven stories or 80 feet of height. Category three allowed up to five stories or 60 feet in height, and category four allowed up to three stories or 40 feet, with a caveat that some dwellings were limited to two and a half stories, which is something we've seen in the early zoning ordinance as a way to limit the sort of triple-decker development, which I think we're going to hear a little bit from, from Charlie Sullivan about. There were a few other district standards. There were some modest setbacks, in some cases some uh, required interior courts, which we don't have requirements for anymore. But overall, use and height were the main factors under which um, zoning was, was regulated. And there was one district, which is called R4, and it's colored in the kind of light yellow that you can see on the map over here and then over here. And the R4 district was the one that did not allow multifamily housing, but it did allow single family, two family, and semi-detached houses or townhouses. And in the, in the sort of darker shades of yellow allowed, um, as well as the, the other districts, allowed uh, multifamily housing with the corresponding increases in height. So I'm pointing that out because it's worth noting as we go through these maps and keeping an eye on how those different shades of yellow kind of 
morph and evolve on the zoning map over time. 1943 is when the population of Cambridge was hitting its peak, uh, but economic development in Cambridge had largely, largely stalled out during the Great Depression and would take a long time to fully recover. And at this point, the system of zoning districts was changed from that kind of R1, B1, B2 to the system that we currently use where there's um, residential districts, uh, business districts, and industrial districts instead of unrestricted. Um, they have designations like BA for business A and IB for industry B. Um, and the R4 district from the previous map was now basically three districts. And two of those districts um, were more restricted than the R4 in that they allowed only single family housing. And one of those districts, the residence A1, required larger lot sizes than, than others, basically requiring a less density than, or allowing less density than even some of the other single family districts. It's interesting that, at first, that although that district exists, at first it was limited to this very small area um, in West Cambridge, I think it's along Highland Street, um, and, uh, but we will see that change over time. And the height limits um, across the city still topped out at 100 feet. Um, there were fewer districts where that 100 foot height was allowed, basically the dark red areas around some of the major squares, not Harvard Square though, but Porter Square and Central Square and such, and um, sort of near Harvard Square along, along the river. Um, and uh, the other, height, other districts had height limits that ranged from 35 to 80 feet. So there's a lot more variability. It would, they didn't fall neatly into those four categories anymore. And although the regulations were still based mostly on height and use, um, we started to see some increased dimensional requirements like greater setbacks and things like maximum lot coverage. So setting a limit on the percentage of the lot that a building could take up. So um, now we get to 1961 and in the post-World War II era, Cambridge, like many other cities, were going through kind of a strange phase where uh, nationwide across the US, the economy was uh, booming, the population was booming, it was literally the baby boom. But um, in Cambridge and cities like it, the population and the economy were actually in decline because all of that growth was moving out to the suburbs. So um, cities were starting to take on some you know, different approaches to their planning in order to try to figure out ways to cope with that, that type of change. One of the things that many people note about the 1961 Cambridge uh, zoning is that height limits were completely removed in districts that had previously allowed um, up to 100 feet. And this was largely reflecting a embrace of the modernist approach to architecture and planning. So there was a, uh, a favorability towards tall buildings situated in open space. Um, it is worth noting though that in most Cambridge neighborhoods, particularly the, the lighter, the two lighter shades of yellow, there was still a height limit that remained at 35 feet. That 35 foot height limit would remain fairly consistent. Um, and to, a, again, a zoning nerd like me, um, the real turning point in the 1961 zoning is the introduction of density limits. So things that people in this room might be familiar with like FAR, floor area ratio, um, lot, maximum lot area per dwelling, minimum lot area per dwelling unit. Um, those standards started, be, started to be put in place uh, instead of height. And that kind of reflected an attitude that density had started to become as much of a concern, if not more of a concern, than land use and height. And in fact, um, if you look at the zoning closely, which, which we've done, um, the buildings that were allowed under the 1961 zoning, even with no height limit, would actually have less floor area than the buildings allowed in the comparable districts in the 1943 zoning ordinance with, with height limits but without those, those density limitations. Um, so to point out a few other changes to the map during this time, um, there was the addition of a district in blue which hadn't been um, in there before, it's labeled O for office. Um, those were districts that were kind of between residential and business. They didn't allow retail or general business, but they allowed workplaces like office and laboratories at a, a fairly high density. Um, and as you look at the, uh, again, looking at the changes in the residential districts, you would see that, and I can go kind of back and forth, you can see that in areas like um, here west of Mass Ave, some of those lighter yellows are starting to kind of fill in some of the areas that were sort of in, in darker yellow. Um, 1977, the Cambridge population was about to hit a new low. 
Um, the economy had yet to fully bounce back, but the stage was being set for some major changes at this point. Um, most of the growth over the previous 20 years had come from universities. Um, they, their campuses were growing, but they weren't yet having the economic impact that they do now. Um, they would become kind of the backbone of the future Cambridge economy. Uh, and the approach to planning at this point shifted away from uh, you know, what, what people think of as the modernist approach to, uh, to planning and redevelopment and towards what was called the community development approach. Um, that relied on more fine-grained area planning. And on the zoning map is, is a bit of a reflection of that, although also a bit of a um, kind of a remnant of the urban renewal area, we see the first special district pop up. Um, and that is what's known and still known as the MXD district in Kendall Square. Um, that was a totally different approach from any of the other base districts in, in zoning, and it was meant to enable mixed use development on land that was, was cleared through urban renewal, and, and many of you who know the history know that that was the NASA site that then you know, kind of became not the NASA site. Um, and as we've, we're starting to introduce <coughs> special districts, some other special things started to pop up at the zoning ordinance at that time, um, special planned unit development zoning, um, special standards to encourage townhouse development started coming up, um, and special permit requirements for fast order food. So, you know, as different kinds of areas and different uses started to become a particular concern, they started to be treated in, in special ways through the zoning. And as you remember from the pages, you know, the zoning ordinance started to get a little bit longer and more complex. Um, again, as we, we've been doing, looking again at the residential districts, the lighter yellow continues to uh, chip away a bit at the darker yellow. The areas to maybe look at here are up here in the uh, Baldwin, uh, what's now the Baldwin neighborhood and Mid Cambridge where it went from uh, more of the kind of higher uh, scale districts down to um, some of the, the lower scale districts, but still in this, in this point allowing uh, multifamily. And uh, the 2001 ordinance and map are probably one of, incorporate some of the biggest changes that have occurred um, in zoning. Uh, many amendments were adopted between 1977 and 2001, as many of these area-specific planning and community-led initiatives started to change the zoning in many different parts of the city. So just that kind of a, a top line, and unfortunately this, this version doesn't have the legend on it, but the number of regular base districts in the zoning ordinance has grown, had grown from the 10 districts in 1943 to 31 districts in uh, 2001. There were also, in addition to those, 17 special base districts, like the, the MXD district, there were 16 more of those. There were 27 overlay zoning districts, including PUD overlay districts, institutional use overlay districts, and various others, those mo further modified the underlying base zoning. Um, and most of those kind of special districts and overlay districts were in areas that had received special planning attention, like Harvard Square, Central Square, and many of those areas the planning was done intentionally with redevelopment in mind, like in areas like the East Cambridge Riverfront, in Kendall Square, in North Point, in Cambridge Port, and in Alewife. Many of the zoning changes were intended to guide a transition from formerly industrial areas to mixed use development, somewhat counterintuitively given that the zoning's original purpose was to kind of designate separate areas for uses and to kind of separate them apart. Um, meanwhile, in the base zoning, where there used to be um, unlimited height in some of those higher density districts, a height, limit, um, height limits up to 120 feet were restored um, in those base zoning districts. Density limits were reduced for commercial uses in mixed use districts. And uh, in the more restrictive residential districts, the densities were brought down even lower. So all of that started to encourage more housing growth in those commercially zoned areas in those mixed use areas. And as you remember, again, from the overview, Cambridge's population was starting to grow back at that point as the economy was starting to grow back. So we started to see more housing growth, but it was happening in, in some of these mixed use um, areas and not so much in, in the residential districts. Um, so for those, speaking of the residential districts, again, for those of you keeping an eye on it, you see that many districts have changed into that lighter shade of yellow. So I'll go back and forth again. So in, in most of northern and western Cambridge and even some parts of um, eastern Cambridge, you start to see um, the, the zoning in those residential areas become more restrictive. 
And the zoning of today is basically the zoning of 2000, I, I've described it as the two, zoning of 2001, but more so, because now we have even more special districts, we have more PUD districts, we have more overlay districts, all driven by area plans. The most recent amendment covered the uh, alewife quadrangle area, which was based on a lot of uh, very careful study and, and engagement with uh, the property owners there. If you look carefully, you can see that the district labels in and around Kendall Square have started to become pretty dense. Um, and that's because that area started to be zoned for many different, more fine grained districts, overlays, in some cases overlays on top of overlays. Um, and all of those were intended to enable very deliberate development outcomes. So um, zoning in the residential areas of the city hasn't changed that much in the past 20 years. Um, one notable recent addition which has, has affected those districts is the affordable housing overlay, which in some ways kind of nods back to the 1924 ordinance or the 1943 ordinance by saying that for affordable housing developments, they would be regulated primarily by use and height and stripping away most of the density limitations. So that is the overview. I wanted to remind everybody again that you can um, uh, submit some questions for the panel. And I'm gonna turn it over to the panelists to give their introductory remarks. We're gonna go more or less, um, I have a sense of, I don't know exactly what the panelists are gonna say, but I have a little bit of a sense of it. So we're gonna go kind of in chronological order and Charlie, um, you can come up here and I'll, I'll hand off to you. Um, so, so Charlie Sullivan is gonna start by talking a little bit about kind of some of the early stages of, of Cambridge history and then we'll pass it off to some of the other panelists and, and then go into our conversation, Charlie. Okay. I'll take this. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Um, I was astonished to realize in Jeff's introduction that I've been here in my position at the Historical Commission for half the life of the zoning code. <laughs> um, I mean, this is this is crazy. <laughs> um, I trained as a city planner, not as an historian. So when I sort of step in these potholes of history and realize how time passes or doesn't pass, uh, sometimes I'm really surprised. If I were an historian, I'd say, yeah, that's what happens. So I wanted to take you through a quick romp through Cambridge history and then talk about some of the motivations for the adoption of the zoning code. Um, so Cambridge famously started in 1630. It was intended to be the capital of Massachusetts. Uh, it uh, did not become that, but it got Harvard University, and so for 130 years, um, it was an academic village and a country town, eight miles from Boston, completely isolated. The population uh, was under 1,000 at the time of the revolution, um, but the, um, the cataclysmic event in the history of Cambridge, the opening of the first bridge direct to Boston, occurred in 1793, and at that point, uh, Cambridge exploded in real estate activity. Um, an area east of Harvard Yard, which had only three farms at the time of the revolution, all of a sudden is crisscrossed by turnpikes and highways. Uh, the bridges are built one after another, a West Boston Bridge, Longfellow Bridge today, the Craigie's Bridge, the River Street, Western Avenue. Uh, roads cut across, real estate development goes wild, and. Uh, uh, 40 years after the opening of the bridge, less than 40 years, the population has exploded by eight times. Um, there's eight times the population in 1830, but it's still only 6,000 people, but it's uh, scheduled to take off. 20 years later, Cambridge, uh, those three villages are beginning to grow together. Um, the population is now 20,000, uh, so it's, it's more than tripled in 20 years. Industry at that time is on the periphery, brick making in North Cambridge, uh, glass making in East Cambridge, soap making uh, on the Brookline Street edge of Cambridgeport, pretty much away from residential neighborhoods. Uh, there was not a great deal of concern um, and large parts of Cambridge were developing into desirable suburbs of Boston. So as the city began to fill up, uh, industries began to expand, especially in the 1890s. Um, by the 1920s, Cambridge was being compared to Detroit uh, and Akron, Ohio, a tire making town, as being an emerging industrial powerhouse. The universities were said to be taking a back seat. Um, but in this map in 1877, you can see the city is beginning to fill in 
We're now approaching 50,000, uh, 47,000 in 1875. Um, so the city began, as the city began to fill up, beginning at the, at the time of the Civil War, uh, there began to be um, regulations, building regulations. Instead of just a, sort of a free-for-all, in 1863, they start with prohibiting encroachments on public ways, that's kind of obvious. Then in 1877, they start doing fire regulations. Uh, 1885, we get our first building code and first building permit um, uh, requirements, so plans now have to be filed with the, with the building department. Um, 1884, we begin to, 94, we begin to edge into zoning with height limits of a uh, limited to 125 uh, feet. I mean, this is, um, that's pretty high for 1894. It, about the same time, wooden buildings uh, restricted to three stories. That's the beginning of the anti-three-decker movement. Um, and, um, and then in 1908, another dimensional requirement, building heights limited to two and a half times the width of a street. You can see that the city is, begin, is trying to uh, cast about for ways of imposing dimensional requirements to limit density. Three-deckers are sort of a, a an associated story. Um, three acres are, were strongly associated with immigrants. Um, if we all like to think of three decres today, you, you buy a three decker, you live in one unit, you rent the other two, or historically you would have. And um, that was an entree to the middle class for generations of immigrants. And that's why the established powers in many cities and towns did not like them. Uh, so the legislature passed a, a Tenement House Act in uh, several acts in 1911, 1913 that authorized cities and towns to ban three-deckers. Belmont did immediately. Uh, Arlington did in the 1920s. Uh, Cambridge did in 1916. But in a housing shortage after World War I, permitted them again um, in, in 1923, just the year before zoning was adopted. Uh, but they weren't as many built in the 1920s. So um, what was motivating people to think about zoning, to take all of those prior uh, methods of controlling uh, urban development and think about zoning was, of course, the New York's experience with adopting the first zoning code and then uh, Cambridge never wanting to be far from the cutting edge. Um, uh, uh, founded a planning board um, around the time of World War I and then began immediately to think about how to, how to cut the city into zoning districts. But the, I think what was on people's minds was the protection of property from fire, public health and welfare, social control of immigrants, and separation of incompatible uses. So protection from fire, this was a really serious issue in, in the 19th century when cities were almost entirely built of wooden construction. Uh, when Boston burned in 1872, um, it had had fire requ requirements for brick construction or stone construction uh, from the 1830s and 40s, but still that wasn't enough. Uh, cities that were primarily wood, uh, like Chicago, um, burned repeatedly and uncontrollably, and these were, these were widespread and quite common disasters. So uh, that's why Cambridge began controlling uh, um, uh, construction. Um, in this case on Howard Street, these two three-deckers are less than three feet apart. Uh, you can barely walk between them. The cornices almost overlap um, at the front, uh, front property line. Public health and welfare um, in an era of communicable disease. Uh, housing density was thought to be a, a major uh, detriment to public welfare. Cambridge had this whole series of epidemics in the, uh, between 1872 and World War I, uh, just one after another, things that we never worry about, particularly today, typhoid, uh, measles, diphtheria, smallpox, um, again and again. And again, density was considered, and, and building codes and standards for sanitation were considered really essential to protecting every resident of the city, not just people living in those high density districts. Uh, Cambridge reformed-minded people began studying housing conditions and social conditions. This is a report from 1914. Um, it was kind of um, um, a little bit of a, of a scary thing. I mean, it was amplified in the press, uh, probably more than it should have been, but 
this um, study, this non-municipal study, did identify areas where population density was excessive and building conditions were um, are frightening. So, and then the whole issue of social control is never mentioned really explicitly in the zoning codes, but it was on people's minds. It was um, really a question, in, in my opinion, about controlling immigrants rather than uh, cr controlling minorities, ethnic, um, racial minorities. This, this chart um, represents the ebb and flow of Cambridge population. I have to point out that after 1950, uh, these numbers differ from, um, from Jeff's because uh, they exclude students uh, who were not in the census count uh, uh, through eight, 1950, but after 1960 and after, uh, did include students, which had the effect of amplifying Cambridge's population by about 20,000 in every decade uh, from 1960 on. So, this graph shows uh, household population of Cambridge and the, in yellow, the, the uh, foreign born. But those are the foreign born, but the, um, the foreign born uh, uh, people with foreign born parents um, in 1920 were 75% of Cambridge's population. So only a quarter of Cambridge's population were American born of American born parents. Um, this was a period when immigration was at a peak. Um, it was finally stopped by the Immigration Acts in the mid 1920s. But Americanization um, was the, the byword uh, and assimilation. And how are we going to assimilate all of these migrants, immigrants, into the American culture? Um, African Americans were never more than 5% of the population in this period. Uh, these were established communities, and as Jeff said, Cambridge was almost entirely built out by this period. So um, the zoning um, that where Cambridge went back and forth on three deckers, um, the effect was um, uh, such that, well, I mean, I'll, I'll stop that uh, with that. Uh, the, the other motivation was separation of incompatible uses. Uh, we, we talked about uh, the spread of industry in Cambridge. Uh, this was an enormously in, in industrialized city. In the early 20th century, industries were spreading into uh, residential neighborhoods, like this uh, Fleischmann's Yeast uh, factory and garage on Inman Street. Uh, built in 1917 in the midst of a residential neighborhood. Um, Hemming uh, is a knitting mill, a knitting mill in Riverside, a uh, candy factory on Green Street in Central Square in a residential neighborhood. That's where the, the labor forces were, and so the industries wanted to build in residential communities, and this was thought to be really something negative to the uh, future of the city. So separating incompatible uses was a strong motivation. Another uh, incompatible, what was initially thought to be an incompatible use were apartment houses. Uh, these examples on Mass Ave from uh, um, 1898 uh, were for decades the tallest buildings in, in Cambridge uh, and weren't really duplicated, but they certainly had an effect on, on the zoning codes. So two more slides. Um, this one, uh, taken in 1921, uh, shows West Cambridge um, from a plane flying over Mount Auburn Cemetery looking towards Fresh Pond. So from left to right, you can see Aberdeen Avenue, you can see Larchwood, uh, Fresh Pond Parkway, um, Grosier Road, uh, uh, Lakeview, or Lexington Avenue on the far right. And there's many, many vacant lots. Uh, there's building activity is beginning to pick up after World War I. Uh, this is the cutting edge of developing Cambridge. This and the back slope uh, down Concord Avenue below beyond Walden Street were the only two undeveloped or still developing neighborhoods in Cambridge at the time zoning was, was established. Um, so this is how uh, things looked a couple of years later in an aerial photo taken in 1929. Uh, Chilton Street is in the lower right-hand corner um, and it shows those three deckers that were built in the period before 1916 when three-decker construction was, was ended. Um, there's also some three-deckers along Standish Street, which is the next street uh, going west, um, and then Lakeview and Lexington Avenue. The three-deckers were all constructed uh, before 1916. Um, there are none 
from the later period. And then after zoning was adopted, there are two families, two family houses are the predominant uh, construction here. So, um, and this is the pattern that took place off Concord Avenue as well, where almost all of those houses were, were two family houses. Um, so I think it's safe to say that the zoning in Cambridge was adopted as the city was almost completely finished. It had taken a, a, a character that we recognize today. Um, uh, ethnic groups and immigrants have come and gone, uh, but those neighborhoods have pretty much persisted uh, throughout history. And um, uh, zoning has been not so much, has, the effect of zoning has not been so much to guide the future expansion of the city and to uh, uh, direct the social composition of, of neighborhoods of the future, but to protect uh, existing neighborhoods and to uh, sort of cement the status quo in place. That's it. We'll take questions later. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so now we're going to hear from John, um, who can step right up on the stage. Um, and again, this is just a little reminder about the uh, sending questions. John. Great. Thank you. I'm actually just going to be using some slides at the very end to illustrate some points. So I'm going to uh, leave up this very exciting slide for the first couple of minutes uh, to thrill you. Uh, so uh, I want to thank um, Jeff and the Community and Development Department for inviting me to speak. Uh, Today, I uh, congratulate you as well for the excellent work uh, digitizing and sharing uh, the records on the evolution of zoning in Cambridge. It's really kind of fascinating as someone who researches and writes in this area. Um, so zoning has changed quite a bit over the past 100 years, uh, not only in Cambridge, but in communities across the United States. Uh, I'm going to spend my time speaking a little bit about the early days of zoning and specifically some legal questions that the earliest proponents of zoning encountered uh, when they proposed and sought to implement this European innovation, the division of cities into zones that separated permissible uses and the scope of those uses um, into American cities. So the central legal issue um, for these advocates of zoning was how to justify this form of land use control as an exercise uh, of what is termed the police power, which is the power of states, which they often delegate to local governments, to legislate in furtherance traditionally of health, safety, morals and the public welfare. And for early 20th century advocates of zoning and for early 20th century American courts, those first two considerations, uh, health and safety, were the soundest bases for uh, legislation. Um, and in Charlie's comments, you saw health and safety playing a role in some of those earliest forms of land use regulation. So cautious of how they'd fare in the courts, the drafters of the earliest uh, forms of land use regulation, by which I mean what really predates zoning, so we're thinking here of height limits, um, we're thinking of regulations maybe of building materials, we're thinking of um, uh, setback requirements. All of these were motivated by a safety concern, particularly the safety concern, as Charlie pointed out, with fire uh, and linked uh, directly to it. But you saw challenges to these height limitations. So height limitations, Boston was uh, across the, the river a, a leader in this, and a, and a major case which went up to the Supreme Court, uh, Welch v. Swazi, uh, saw a limit um, to the imposition of lower height limits in certain parts of Boston uh, on the ground that, in contrast with those areas subject to higher limits, um, these unreasonably infringed upon the property rights of the owners, denied them a right to equal treatment, uh, and were simply aesthetic in nature, that they bore no relationship to traditional police power concerns. And I emphasize all of that because, of course, this was going to be the same arguments that early advocates would make against zoning itself, that by dividing cities into different districts and subjecting them to different regulations, some of them to stricter regulations, uh, it treated them unequally or denied them their property rights. Uh, those claims were ultimately rejected in, in the Welch case, you know, on the grounds that, uh, you know, as has been mentioned, there were safety concerns with prevention of fire, um, there were public health concerns related to the exclusion of light, air, and sunshine on the grounds that that would cause public health concerns. Um, but even after that case, you saw um, opponents of these height restrictions questioning them and questioning, in some sense, uh, the science and the expert reports upon which these rationales rested, um, pointing out, for instance, that taller new construction of first-class buildings might very well be much safer than existing shorter second-class buildings. The other line of inquiry I want to highlight in kind of these early debates is, of course, um, early challenges um, to regulation around single-family zoning. So 
Early challenges to zoning regulations also relied in part on arguments which were grounded in kind of the broader police power jurisprudence of the day, which um, kind of focused oftentimes on questions of uh, legislation around um, working conditions and wages and famous Lochner case. Um, there was an argument made that certain legislation was prohibited under the police power if it was quote unquote class legislation, which was meant to uh, uh, mean that it advanced the interests of a particular class of people rather than the broader public or general welfare. And so critics of zoning made this precise argument. Um, for example, nearby in Brookline, Massachusetts, there was an early legal challenge to the city single family zoning. And the petitioners in that case, um, Brett v. the building commissioners of Brookline, sought to build a two family house in a single family district, challenging the health and safety rationale for prohibiting that. Uh, and contending that excluding multifamily buildings from single family districts fostered class segregation and unfairly allowed only those residents wealthy enough to enjoy the benefits, ample light and air, that a neighborhood of single family homes on large lots provided. So the court, uh, the, ultimately that case um, as well went up, uh, but the uh, Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, when it decided this case, so the state Supreme Court, uh, relied upon a very broad definition of the police power. And so what this signifies is that this period you saw this broadening of the justifications that were acceptable to courts for zoning and land use regulation. So they first invoked kind of more traditional health and safety rationale, reasoning that uh, because a two-family house would have two families in it, there'd likely be more stoves and more lights, and so therefore the likelihood of fire in that house would be much more significant. Hard to believe in hindsight that that actually won the day, but that was considered to be a, uh, a concern. Uh, the second was it found that this ordinance promoted health and general physical and mental welfare of society that having every family live in its own house would, quote, increase fresh air, freedom for play of children, movement for adults, opportunities to cultivate a bit of land, and reducing the spread of contagious diseases. So we see in this a steady movement at the time from reliance on health and safety rationales to this broader concept of the public welfare. And um, scholars, courts at the time, recognized the idea that public welfare was in many ways a more inchoate, uh, undefined concept than health and safety, which were seen to have clearer meaning. So um, it, harbin it was a harbinger of an expansion. Um, and the result of that, of course, was you saw um, uh, very quickly um, some jurisdictions like Newton, Massachusetts, which had not initially adopted single-family zoning in its initial zoning code. Um, the legislature sought to do it, but the mayor vetoed it. The mayor's veto of that measure was actually, uh, he said at the time, he believed it was unconstitutional to have single-family zoning uh, and that it uh, savored of class legislation, so going back to that concern I expressed, but once the state Supreme Court had ruled single-family zoning permissible, uh, in Brookline, and Newton adopted it. Now, Cambridge, as was mentioned before, was a little bit later, and, and not alone, many American cities were similar. The 1940s saw kind of a number of cities that in the 20s had decided to have their least dense district be two-family, move on to uh, adopt uh, single-family districts as well. Um, and of course, there was questions at the time about where to draw the line and whether there was rationale and health and safety to draw the line at two versus one family or whether this was you know, somewhat of an arbitrary decision. Um, so kind of in summing this up, I want to say these early debates over the validity of zoning uh, and the relationship of zoning to traditional police powers uh, admittedly can seem a bit quaint today. Um, in the intervening century, the courts um, broadly uh, accepted um, broader understandings of the police power. They gradually accepted the idea that zoning could simply pursue aesthetic goals, um, divorced from anything having to do with health, safety, or welfare. Um, and I would submit that much of our zoning today is really just about aesthetics. Uh, the history of zoning in Cambridge, I would say, over the 20th century, also reflects this same steady expansion of zoning's purposes and an expansion that moves away from traditional police power concerns with health and safety towards a broader and arguably more amorphous set of goals, preventing overcrowding, increasing amenities, encouraging appropriate economic development, protecting residential neighborhoods from incompatible uses. And to kind of suggest this, you know, I, um, you know, I had this uh, set of the purposes of zoning as articulated in the city's zoning codes, which Jeff shared with us, uh, and I want to kind of map them a little bit. So the 1924 uh, code was kind of quite kind of straightforward and just kind of stating this focus on protecting specific districts of the city from unsuitable new buildings or uses, of course, leaving a little bit open-ended what unsuitable meant. But in subsequent articulations, you saw uh, much more uh, specific purposes stated. So I have these kind of mapped here 
The left is kind of your traditional health, safety, and welfare. The right is what I would call kind of an expanded set of justifications for zoning that kind of move away from traditional police power considerations. Uh, and then you've got some that I kind of throw in the middle, like light and air. So, you know, initially you had general welfare, you had health, you had fire, safety, and then you had some uses that were a little bit more expanded. Appropriate use of land, as I said, somewhat open-ended, uh, ensuring the value of property, lessening congestion, avoiding undue concentration. Uh, over time, the entries on the right expand. So the red indicates new uh, concerns that are expressed. The bold indicates, to my mind, traditional uh, health, safety, and welfare considerations. And so you see more and more on the right, facilitating adequate provision of infrastructure, increasing amenities, preventing overcrowding in 1961. Uh, by 1977, you get rid of health, safety, convenience, morals, or welfare as an express purpose, and you start to have a lot more uh, on the right side, open space, conservation of resources, economic development, engaging housing for persons of all income levels. 1977, you got even more on the right side, uh, and then into 2001. And so you see this kind of study, steady expansion over time, um, which again may not be alarming to us, depending upon how we see kind of the nature of regulation and, and the nature of private property rights, but it definitely represents a rapid departure. Um, so Charles Haar, one of the foremost land use scholars of the 20th century, uh, one of Molly's predecessors at Harvard Law School in the, in the land use uh, realm, declared in 1989, uh, that the extension of the police power through zoning represented, quote, one of the major judicial innovations of our century, as well as the most important redefinition of the nature of private property ever made in U.S. courts. Um, and we don't really appreciate that, I would say today, how radical in some respects zoning is. I mean, zoning, we talk sometimes often about the uh, Euclid case in 1926 where the Supreme Court upheld zoning. It heard argument in that case twice. After the first argument, it seemed likely that it was going to strike down zoning as not a valid exercise of the police power, um, but then it was convinced through additional briefing, some of the justices, it seems, changed their votes. Uh, and so there's a little contingency there, but of course now we've moved far away from that. Uh, I'll leave for now the normative question of whether this expansion of scope, purposes, and in turn the complexity of zoning, that we're now at over 600 pages, uh, is a good thing or not, uh, but I want to suggest that we at least kind of think about the um, ways in which it has changed over time um, and the significance that has for uh, thinking about uh, our current uh, situation. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, so at this point, we're out of slides, and I'm going to ask all of the panelists to come up so we can we can kind of sit and have our, our little conversation. And we'll have the other uh, other panelists. I'll just leave this up as, again as a reminder if you've forgotten what the code is. Um, Do you want to go which, which part of the it? The 1924 um, map? The map? Yeah. Okay. Sure. It's, yeah. it's a ways back. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Thank you. We're go. go ahead, Molly. All right. Thank you. And I, I do not have slides, swamp womp. Um, so, uh, but I will echo um, John's uh, thanks, everyone involved, especially Jeff, um, for coordinating this and for asking me uh, to, to talk. Um, I am going to pick up on a couple threads uh, that both, I think, uh, Charlie and John um, talked a little bit about by talking about the early history of zoning and um, one way in which Cambridge was totally typical and another way in which it maybe could have mattered a lot to zoning history, but then it flamed out, which is basically by uh, being the subject, uh, its zoning ordinance being the subject of one of uh, the other early important Supreme Court cases um, uh, involving zoning uh, in 1928. So I'm going to talk about both uh, these things. Um, the first is to note that before we had zoning, um, there was still land use regulation, and Charlie already illustrated this through uh, his recounting of uh, various forms of what we think of as kind of proto land use regulation. Um, but there was something else still, and it was actually on Charlie's slides, um, which is that there was private land use regulation before um, there was zoning. Um, and this was typically done 
uh, again, privately through something called deed restrictions. Um, so deed restrictions often are put in by subdividers of land that could be a big large scale developer, uh, or it could just be someone subdividing their lot into two and putting a restriction um, on some of the subdivided properties. Uh, and there were lots of different types of restrictions, both here in Cambridge uh, and beyond. And my own kind of recent scholarship has focused on these and what particularly in an era of potential zoning liberalization, uh, the, the history of private land use regulation might tell about some of the next battles uh, to be fought. Um, restrictions in deeds of many types uh, were prevalent um, in what were then the suburban areas uh, of Cambridge in the late 1800s, so West Cambridge uh, and the like, and they prescribed all sorts of things. Again, this is not public land use regulation, but this is deed restrictions. Things like setbacks, uh, things restricting to residential purposes only, things restricting to houses of a certain construction like brick or a certain value, uh, although it's laughable now, something like $2,500 um, in uh, West Cambridge, um, and also uh, uh, restrictions against noxious, noxious uses or nuisances. Um, so deed restrictions basically promising and trying to control even 50 years before Cambridge's massive industrial expansion, um, the, uh, the evolution of the industry. Uh, interestingly, some of those covenants uh, against noxious uses start to spell out what uses they consider noxious. And I think of this as an early harbinger uh, of things to come in public land use regulation because it starts out prohibiting things that one would think of as obviously noxious. So, you know, we will not permit noxious trades like slaughterhouses, cabinet makers, tanneries, things that would have obvious um, negative effects on neighborhoods. And slowly that list starts to expand and morph. Uh, to the point where you start getting things like circuses, which yes, maybe you wouldn't want that next door, but was that really a risk? Uh, museums, uh, parks, and then tenements, um, and ultimately also apartments. So even before um, the first zoning ordinance, you have through private land use regulation, the effort to establish zones that at a minimum are free um, of apartments through private uh, land use regulation. Um, Cambridge newspapers before 1924 um, do reveal some interesting controversies in the city involving deed restrictions. Um, individual owners were starting to fight deed restrictions, particularly in about the last decade before zoning, uh, the first zoning ordinance, particularly those involving uh, setbacks, but also those that purported to limit districts uh, to residential uh, and residential housing. Um, one dispute that I found quite amusing, um, which I think is from 1919, it's on what, was, what is now Aberdeen, uh, sought to lift a residences only restriction um, for a gas station. And part of the argument for why this deed restriction should be lifted was that people don't want to live near creepy Mount Auburn Cemetery um, and all the creepy things happening inside. So just fabulous um, as, a, as a sort of prehistory of zoning here in Cambridge. Again, calls for zoning are happening as people are attacking deed restrictions. And I think the potential weakness of deed restrictions that could be lifted by judges is also part of the reason that uh, zoning, in addition to the invasion of industry, um, seems uh, desirable. Um, thus, we do see you know, calls in the same newspapers. John Nolan writes one, he's a landscape architect here in Cambridge, um, who submits a letter to the Cambridge Tribune uh, as early as 1916, calling the attention of the Cambridge public to the need for regulation of high apartment houses here in Cambridge. In a good residential section, the coming of the apartment house usually means a considerable loss to all owners of private houses. And these cries are successful. Uh, it takes a little while, but uh, in 1924, of course, we get the first ordinance. And uh, I'm sure Charlie would actually know more than I do here, but it seems like it was not particularly controversial um, here in Cambridge in ways that it was uh, in other cities where property owners sometimes fought uh, zoning as an undue restriction on their own property rights or their rights to sell property. It doesn't seem to have uh, engendered the same level of controversy um, here. On the national stage, John has already mentioned uh, the Euclid case. So just two years um, after uh, the first zoning ordinance here in Cambridge, uh, the city of, or rather the village of Euclid versus Ambler Realty case is heard by uh, the Supreme Court. This is a facial attack on zoning, meaning basically the claim was that zoning itself was an illegitimate use of the state's power um, because it pursued unlawful possible class um, designation or class legislation or, uh, and also uh, perhaps you know, unlawful uh, aesthetic aims. Um, this doesn't succeed. It's a close decision, um, and it's written by Chief 
Justice Sutherland, who was notorious in other decisions for writing down, uh, writing opinions that uh, struck down legislation. So it's a little bit of a, an interesting mystery what, uh, what causes him to switch his vote or what causes him to go pro-regulation uh, in the zoning case, but that's what he does. And so uh, facially zoning survives after Euclid. But what's interesting um, is that two years later, um, Cambridge and Cambridge's zoning ordinance makes it to the Supreme Court. Um, in a decision called Necto versus the city of Cambridge. And so I just wanted to say a word uh, about this case because it's, a, it's actually interesting. It's the, basically the one time the Supreme Court steps in uh, and invalidates a zoning ordinance uh, is to come in and invalidate part of um, uh, the 1924 ordinance. And I had Jeff put the picture back up because you can actually see the line um, that was the controversy in uh, Necto on this map. Um, and so I think this will turn into a little light thing. Oh, look at me. All right, so do you see this here where there's like part of the street here is Brookline and there's a yellow residential and then it turns into purple? So it bisected basically on the other side of Brookline uh, what was then land owned by um, a very small time speculator, Saul Necto, um, who owned two residential lots that are there zoned residential um, uh, in the yellow and also an industrial lot, but he had agreed basically to sell these three lots together to the Ford Motor Company for, uh, I think it was $63,000. And again, there's like, he's not a big time speculator, so, but this is his one land speculation deal. And so he fights when uh, the zoning ordinance is gonna prevent the assembly of this parcel and basically using it all for um, uh, industrial purposes. Interestingly, um, uh, before Necto's plan to sort of consolidate, this had been the Clark uh, Telescope Company um, and the residences of, I think, two members of the Clark family. So in some ways, the zoning ordinance tried to replicate or match what was, uh, had been on the ground a decade earlier, which was two houses and then a, a more industrial part. Uh, but that doesn't win the day in the Supreme Court, which sort of goes forth in the Necto opinion um, and says, well, ordinarily, we don't second guess um, zoning authorities, but this is totally irrational. Um, and that this line, there is no sort of reason why you couldn't bump the industrial uh, one block further north and west uh, to Brookline. Um, and they haven't advanced any reason for that. And so strikes, uh, strikes that down, the enforcement of that down against um, Necto. This is interesting for a lot of reasons. First, I should say this property now is 350 Brookline Street. I believe it's the MIT Furniture Exchange. So you can go by and drive and think, Saul Necto is the reason there's this weird building here. Um, but uh, what to make of Necto is something that's of great interest um, to land use historians. Because again, we have the facial attack on zoning uh, upheld, uh, the uphold zoning in Euclid. And then just two years later, the Supreme Court says, but you know, as applied to any individual parcel, we might give a little bit more searching review um, and does it in a case involving Cambridge, but then never again uh, takes a case. And lower courts, state and federal courts, uh, do not take them up on that invitation and instead adopt a very deferential attitude in general toward zoning. So uh, there's multiple ways to view this. One is maybe some more judicial review of zoning um, might be a good thing. Um, you know, that it might sort of provide an additional layer um, uh, of review, uh, thinking through sort of what are the purposes being advanced? Are there reasons for drawing the lines where they are drawn? On the other hand, um, you could look at Necto and say, thank God the court get out of this business uh, and stopped get second guessing uh, the professionals. But again, in trying to read the tea leaves of early zoning history, Necto is an important chapter and sort of whether it's sort of lost promise of judicial review. Uh, and again, it takes place right here in Cambridge. So it's interesting for that reason. I'll subside. <laughs> Yeah, so the, I think the rest of the panelists, you can, you can stay there if you want. So Amy's gonna go next. Sure, great, hey, I'm Amy Dane. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about my research on zoning. I'm starting my story in 2004. I was just out of grad school and I got hired to do a study on regulatory barriers to housing development. 
uh, to understand a bit about the housing shortage and the escalating prices in 2004. And so I did this study of 187 cities and towns in Greater Boston, that's all the cities and towns within 50 miles of Boston, not including the city of Boston itself. And I went through their zoning bylaws and ordinances, I went through all their master plans, their community development plans, I went through their road design standards, their septic system regulations, their wetlands regulations, and came up with this just mega list and database of regulatory barriers to housing development. But one thing that really stood out to me was there wasn't enough zoning for multifamily housing in particular. This was something where I found there wasn't a whole lot of land area dedicated to zoning for multifamily housing. And we're talking in you know, all of like suburban Boston area. Um, there were strict limits on the dimensions allowed for multifamily housing. Um, and the approval processes were really challenging, unpredictable, you know, discretionary from town to town. Um, then to that, from 2004 on, there was all this advocacy to zone for more um, multifamily housing for a long time on this, and especially a push to zone for more predictable permitting for as of right zoning. I got the opportunity to update that study, but just looking at it, I was like, I can't do all of that again. So I just in 2019 did a study um, of zoning for multifamily housing, and that time I looked at 100 cities and towns in Greater Boston, um, not the full 187 of the first study, um, but I found again that the zoning was incredibly restrictive for multifamily housing. One of the things that was notable in that time period is a whole lot of the zoning that changed from 2004 um, to 2019 was this sort of parcel by parcel rezoning for multifamily housing. So it wasn't that places were saying, let's like pick a new district for multifamily housing, covering lots of parcels because there's a need for more multifamily housing. But instead, it's like a factory would be um, redeveloped or a certain company would leave a big parcel or a church would close or there'd just be a school building that needs to be redeveloped. And then a municipality would look at that one parcel and sort of do the rezoning for that parcel. So it became a very like discretionary process. If you you want to redevelop, you often um, would have to go to town meeting for approval of your project or go to city council. It could take years. Um, and then, you know, aside from that, in general, um, to get approval for a multifamily project, if you're not going through a rezoning process, you almost always needed a special permit. I did a survey, I called all these building inspectors for the 100 communities and asked, you know, in the last three years, um, how many of your units were permitted um, by special permit, by right, by 40B, and through a couple of other mechanisms? You know, the vast majority were not by right. Um, so it was just sort of confirmed that this is a very discretionary, like unpredictable process, that zoning isn't really what it had traditionally been or what the textbooks say that you could look up for your property, you know, what use is allowed, what dimensions are allowed, what district are you in, you can know what you're gonna build. If you wanna build multifamily housing, it's sort of this dance um, where you don't know what the outcome's gonna be when you enter the process. Um, so that's something like I had looked at um, I also had other study um, findings in that 2019 study, like a lot of the zoning for multifamily housing is to put multifamily housing on the edge of town, in particular on the far side of the highway from the rest of the town. And if you can find a parcel that's like sandwiched in between a highway, train tracks, and water, that's where multifamily housing will get approved and where it'll get built all across the region. So it's sort of this pattern of like moving it out to the edges of town and also allowing a little bit in the traditional town centers, which we have hundreds of in greater Boston. They're amazing. Um, there was a view, you know, that that adding some more multifamily housing to those walkable areas will add to the vitality and help stores um, stay in business and add to the amenities and the cafes. So there was some approval of that, um, but in a very kind of surgical way of just a little bit of density here and there. So anyway, that's uh, just my bringing us up to the current day. But then last year I got this opportunity to look even further back at the history of zoning and I knew that zoning was exclusionary. I knew just like based on this that the cities and towns aren't allowing for enough multifamily housing and that that had an exclusionary effect segregating the region by race and class. But what I wanted to understand is that was that segregation on purpose as we looked back 
Is that sort of what was going on, or was that just like a side effect that you're regulating because of like fire issues or the aesthetics, or um, you're concerned about water quality and air quality, and concerned about traffic and concerned about the parking and where you're going to park? Is the side effect segregation, or was that a purpose? So my idea was I was going to go back through a hundred years of like local plans. Because, um, you know, the zoning itself has these like vague purposes written in, but it really doesn't speak much to the purposes. But I wanted to see in like the master plans, comprehensive plans that cities and towns had written for decades back, like what were they saying were their purposes. Um, and not that they would always tell us, but sometimes they did. Um, and I'm going to skip what I wrote in my report about the 20s and 30s, because I think that um, the team here did a great job covering those eras. But just quickly to get into the post-war era, the plans of the post-war era were very explicit that a purpose of zoning was for um, lifting the socioeconomic status of communities. There was a clear sense of sorting where each municipality stands and that zoning was used to, um, in a widespread way, to improve the socioeconomic standing of municipalities. And that that standing was associated with like low density development, you know, single family houses on large lots and minimum of multifamily houses. So that was pretty explicit in that time period. Um, but then we get to um, the 1970s, and there was just this moment that I call the big down zone, where you saw it from town to town, city to city. And I'm not sure uh, in terms of Cam where Cambridge fits into this like moment in time, but it was across so many places, um, so widespread of um, either prohibiting multifamily housing, passing a moratorium, uh, increasing the restrictions on you know the dimensions. So like maybe the municipality allowed six stories or four stories, and now it's like three stories for multifamily housing, reducing the allowed density. So maybe you could have eight units in a building, but not more. Um, a lot of restrictions, this like huge down zone, and it just happened in this like big wave, especially in 1970. To 1973, 1974, um, and I was really like interested, like what was that about? And first of all, none of the plans named race as a purpose, like a racial segregation as a purpose for the big down zone. And they wouldn't have, they would have known very explicitly that that is illegal and they would be in like big trouble and the courts would get involved if they named that as a purpose. Um, but what was happening at this moment leading to this like region-wide movement, and let's just remember that at this time to change zoning, you needed a two-thirds vote. So they get that kind of agreement. You know how hard it is to change zoning, to get the two-thirds vote again and again and again across municipalities in this really short period of time. So what was happening then? This was coming right on the heels of the um, U.S. government passing all this landmark civil rights legislation was one thing. Um, the Boston area, the Great Migration, had picked up to the Boston area in the 1960s, so the black um, population of Greater Boston was growing. In 1965, the federal government changed the immigration policy, finally like lifting um, the sort of ban on immigration, and immigration picked up to um, the Greater Boston area, including especially a lot of Spanish-speaking immigrants coming into the community at that time and then in the early 70s school desegregation and the whole like busing crisis and moment was happening simultaneously with these this down zone and with a lot of people sort of moving out from Boston as all of this was happening um, and then I looked to the plans they weren't saying we were down zoning out of like racist motives but what they repeated in their dot public documents over and over was that we want to protect the status quo. And some said we want to protect our socioeconomic status. But what I want to say about like just using the terms protect the status quo, this is a time period where race was all over the news where this was sort of the movement and the moment in the history and that there is nobody who's looking at like what's the status quo in Belmont? <laughs> that this is a white community. Um, what's the status quo of Weston, that this is a very wealthy and white community? Um, that embedded in the use of that language was an understanding of both class and race. Um, although in the 1970s, it became then like taboo to talk about uh, um, socioeconomic status as a reason for zoning and she sort of moved into this new era in the late 1970s on where this official purpose of zoning became um, to promote diversity. 
Um, and the language was of like allowing um, diverse people to come into our communities, but it wasn't necessarily a change in like the practice of zoning. The language changed, and I just noticed on the purposes that John put up there, that was from the like uh, later, one of, not from the 1970s, but it was 2001, but it included encourage housing for persons of all income levels. And that was a purpose you wouldn't have seen in like the 1950s zoning, uh, but after the 1970s, that kind of purpose went into most um, zoning codes. Um, but what I wanted to say is sort of embedded in the zoning of the region is this history that most places um, change zoning incrementally. So the things that happened in these past decades um, is really like a basis of uh, like our housing supply and our zoning laws that we currently have. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Amy. Not to step too much into this, but I'll, I'll note as a footnote to that that the um, in our research, what we found, so that was the 1977 ordinance where encouraging you know, affordable housing started to pop up. That actually comes from the 1975 Zoning Act in Massachusetts. So if you look back at that and you look at other documents associated, that was dur during that period in the 70s, the state um, at a state level really started to become concerned about you know, housing affordability and, and how that was being impacted. Um, and that carried through to the other communities. Um, so last but not least, Les, do you want to stand up? Sure. Do you want me to go to any particular slide? Could you put <coughs> one of the later zoning like maps up there? Um, one. Yeah, that one's fine. Yeah. It's nice to be here. This is the first excuse I've had to wear a tie in about 15 <laughs> years, so I appreciate that. Um, uh, I started in 1981, um, which was sort of in the bid beginning of the resurgence of uh, planning and zoning uh, and development in the city, which um, has occurred for the past 40 years now. And it was an exciting time to be part of the, uh, the city and the efforts it was making to, to regulate the development and encourage new development in the city. Um, uh, Jeff m made mention of the increasing number of zoning districts um, over time, and uh, I made a calculation reviewing the 2009 zoning ordinance, and there were actually 73 districts in the city of Cambridge. The city is six square miles, so that's a lot of zoning district for <laughs> a small city like that. Um, obviously, trying to do a number of things um, and I'd like to focus on uh, a couple of examples of small-scale development in, in the, the neighborhoods uh, where the desire is to control development, not shut it off, but uh, regulate it so that it's consistent with the existing pattern of development. Um, one is in these yellow areas, um, during the 60s and 70s, we would begin to see um, apartment buildings pop up, sort of bland, square, brick, multifamily housing with um, frequently open air parking on the ground floor. We used to derisively call them Arlington pillboxes. Um, the, <coughs> the desire of the planning board and the community was to encourage something more compatible with the wood frame construction in our neighborhoods, and they developed uh, a townhouse ordinance to, to do that. What they did was give incentives for uh, development of existing lots rather than encouraging the accumulation of one or two lots to build these larger brick apartment buildings. And they did that by giving a little more floor area making it, uh, reducing the setbacks required so that you could build townhouses in long ranges on uh, individual lots. And um, was in the end quite successful for a number of years um, until uh, the value of residential property, I suspect, got so great that you couldn't accumulate the single family and, and two family housing lots to build these 
uh, unpleasant uh, apartment buildings. <coughs> that uh, occurred principally in the yellow, the darker yellow districts in the city. Um, and uh, th the regulation was relatively su successful until um, uh, people began to object actually to the townhouses filling in the backyards of uh, lots and over time the regulations got uh, <coughs> revised to uh, make it less, in less, fewer incentives to build those uh, forms of housing. <coughs> in uh, Harvard Square and Central Square over the years they had always been thought of as sort of the commercial heart of the city. Um, over time, obviously, we have focused on uh, the eastern and western portions of the city with uh, large-scale development that we've uh, seen occurring in the past 15 and 20 years. But in Harvard Square and Central Square, the desire was to encourage development, but development that was consistent with the pattern of development already established. Uh, those two districts uh, <coughs> in uh, the 1960 ordinance had no height limit. Um, and in the 80s, we established overlay districts, which limited the height and introduced the notion of historic preservation as one of the desirable goals and gave incentives uh, in the ordinance to uh, encourage development that would respect the historic nature of those two districts. <coughs> uh, I think over time it's proved to be quite successful in accomplishing that goal. And over time, uh, Charlie's uh, organization, the Historical Commission, developed a whole set of regulations that were uh, uh, a set of regulations that were appropriately um, related to the zoning ordinance that in combination resulted in the preservation of the character of those districts while allowing uh, reasonable development to occur um, otherwise. And then the last example I'd like to talk about is <coughs> the North Mass Ave corridor from the Cambridge Common north uh, all the way to uh, almost the Arlington town line. In the mid 80s, the neighborhood uh, was quite concerned about uh, the potential both for excessive height in terms of residential development. Um, the zoning allowed up to eight stories of housing along that stretch of road. Uh, you, as you uh, exit Porter Square on the left, you'll see a, a large apartment building, uh, which I think is eight stories high. Uh, what's your uh, road, Charlie? That the apartment building is located at the corner on that. Corner of Arlington Street? No, 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 north of Porter Square. Coxwell Avenue, yeah. yeah. So that would have been a fairly typical housing pattern throughout the uh, district from uh, north of the Common all the way to Arlington if the, the, the economic uh, circumstances uh, would allow it. <coughs> and secondarily, uh, while well, the economy was not so vigorous and there wasn't a lot of development occurring, there was concern that this stretch of Massachusetts Avenue would become very suburban in character. And you can uh, appreciate the kind of suburban development you get in commercial areas with a lot of parking surrounding small buildings uh, and buildings set back from the road. Uh, there was also concern um, with the nature of the design of buildings in um, another building north of Porter Square, 
which we, uh, I think it was named after the developers called the Bandar building, as I recall, uh, was a mode of development everyone did not want to see replicated. It was a glass building, four or five stories tall, with um, parking underneath open to the street with no street activity. So uh, the notion was through the overlay district we would um, introduce the design standards, reduce the height of the housing permitted, um, and uh, encourage a street form of urban development that is typical elsewhere in the city. And um, that set of regulations, I think, went into effect in the 80s. And we've actually seen the result of that in a number of circumstances. Um, way up on North Mass Ave, there are a couple of buildings which were built to the street line as required, have the uh, num amount of glass on the facade that the ordinance required. Um, and uh, we have many, many housing developments up in that area which reflect the lower housing heights um, that the zoning <coughs> was imposing. So it's been fairly successful in the, the uh, uh, meeting the goals of both the community and the zoning has uh, developed. And um, is an example of the small scale kinds of activity um, that the zoning is capable of uh, developing. Um, quite aside from the large scale development we see in the, the uh, development areas. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that was fantastic. I really learned a lot from all of that. Um, and we have uh, a little bit of time left for questions. And uh, my teal, my uh, intrepid staff member, has sent me over a, a list of some of the questions we've gotten from the audience. So I'll try to uh, go a few different directions. And I wanted to start just with one of my own because as I've been listening to everybody. Um, and as we've been doing this work, you know, we've been talking around this one issue a lot of, you know, what is what does zoning say it's about, and you know, what does it say is its purpose, and then what is its actual purpose, and how does it connect with what its sorry with what its purpose is supposed to be. So my my first question is just pretty pretty open ended, you know, what you know, putting all of that aside, putting all the words aside, and just looking at the actual history of it, what is zoning for? And just what's your and just what's your take on it, if you have one? This is for anybody that wants to jump in. I think that people show up for zoning meetings and they express all sorts of concerns about development, like really diverse concerns. And I think those are real concerns about traffic and parking and flooding and privacy and shadows um, and aesthetics and infrastructure and school capacity. Those are real concerns and zoning is like a tool for addressing those. Um, but I think that they're as I sort of mentioned, that I think that motivating and animating zoning reform, whether spoken or unspoken, is this other force of uh, socioeconomic ranking of exclusivity and sort of all the benefits that go with exclusivity that are achievable through zoning policy. And there are, you know, like a lot of economists who write on this, who in recent years have been talking about, like it's all about the property values. Um, but I think that property values is sort of one piece of like a package of things that come with becoming like an exclusive community, achievable through zoning um, of all sorts of things, of like 
including your property values, but like your access to social networks and jobs and all the sort of benefits that come from sort of being in a very affluent area. And that when we look at Greater Boston and you look at the zoning policy, it becomes clear that it's been an explicit policy across decades to concentrate advantage and privilege in certain geographic areas and to concentrate disadvantage in other geographic areas. And it has just huge implications for like the polarization of the country um, and for social mobility and um, has impacted migration patterns in the whole country where people aren't moving to areas of opportunity the way they did in past decades because there isn't affordable housing um, and there's a housing shortage in those areas. Um, so I think that when we, it's like the housing theory of everything, it's like the zoning theory of everything that like when we look at the country's polarization and some part of that is about like zoning policy across the country. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, so I, I think, so certainly early on, I think there was a notion of kind of zoning as addressing kind of ex-ante things that would potentially become nuisances. Um, but then there was also uh, something that I think remains a theme in zoning, which is the desire to kind of balance public and private investment. So directing growth in certain places, if you're doing it pursuant to planning in a way that ideally kind of um, fosters private development, but allows for public infrastructure to support it. So I think that that is a purpose zoning can and should serve. But you know, I do agree with Amy in that there is also a component of zoning that is, uh, one law professor described to her, that zoning is taxidermy in some respects. That we just preserve the status quo for, because we like the status quo. Um, but it doesn't always generally work because if we preserve the status quo and don't allow growth, we tend to have neighborhoods that change a lot in terms of composition, even though they don't change in terms of buildings because people get priced out of them. Um, but I think that is also a goal that people have, which is preserving existing status quo. But uh, those, are, those are the purposes that I think most often inform what people would do when they do zoning. Yeah, can I, I just want to pick up on two things. I would also put a thumb on the scale about nuisance avoidance. But I just want to say about protecting um, property value, kind of an interesting um, historical note. Because I do think that there are a lot of people who are sincerely motivated and who have been told, you know, by generations um, of financial advisors that, you know, their asset is their home. And so there's a lot of scholarship showing why people rationally, um, you know, make decisions, even if motivated by the best of intentions. Um, uh, that preserve their property values. Um, I'm a millennial, and so of a generation that um, does not have uh, home ownership rates compared to the um, generations uh, before it. One thing I think is interesting, um, and I was, don't mean to make a broader political comment here, is that um, when uh, in 1917, um, as zoning is being debated, apart from all the things that we've uh, discussed, one argument for single family zoning is um, it will make good young capitalists um, as uh, in the face of the pressures of communism. Um, and it will make people patriots um, because they will all have a little slice of land to cultivate and to grow their family on. Um, and if they're systematically deprived of this, they will be politically agitating. Um, and so I think of this as kind of interesting um, in our current moment where homeownership is out of uh, reach for a lot of people um, in younger generations and just harkens back to that sort of weird um, quirk of what's happening in 1917 that is part of the political discourse of why zoning should take off. I've been rather pr proud of Cambridge over the 30 years, 40 years, uh, 30 years that I've been involved, 40 years that uh, uh, up to date uh, with the uh, changes in our, our zoning since 1980. Um, lots of complaints from neighbors uh, at public hearings, uh, public hearings which go on seemingly, seemingly endlessly. Uh, wear you down, but in the end, they've been very supportive of the massive changes, particularly that have occurred in East Cambridge, uh, uh, with commercial development and a lot of housing development at very high densities in tall towers as well as uh, in other forms of uh, housing. Uh, and um, we have to admit that uh, 
Well, it doesn't stink like a sausage factory. A new development does have consequences beyond the site of the development that affects people's lives, and they deservedly uh, should expect the city to uh, give some protection for that uh, negative impact. We, we early on uh, in the development of our uh, lab and uh, research development uh, industry discovered that the massive uh, equipment that's required to cool the labs and keep the animals happy and keep the people inside happy resulted in a lot of noise that went very far into the neighborhoods uh, and was uh, could be quite disruptive if not well uh, attended to and so that uh, you know, they aren't the noxious businesses of the past, but they can result in negative uh, impacts on very uh, nearby neighborhoods. Cambridge is very dense, of course, and everything is very close together. And I, I have to admire Cambridge for managing the transitions between housing and our commercial development quite well, I think, for the most part, across the city. Uh, but zoning plays an important role in, in mediating those ever-present conflicts. Thanks. No, we get a pass. Okay, that's fine. We have more questions. Um, so we, we can get some questions from the audience. I know we're, we're probably not gonna have time to get to all of these, but there was one that, that kind of spoke to me. This is maybe somebody who, who um, heard my joke at the beginning. Um, so sometimes you know, zoning's th uh, zoning boundaries seem arbitrary, so that was, uh, um, one of the things about the Nectow discussion, if you look at the map, this is sort of back to the 2001 map, you know, it's funny that Nectow site is still, still combined where, where it should be, but if you look at the rest of the zoning map and how chopped up all the rest of it is, it's like, did that principle really hold in? Um, but the, the question, which is, is kind of interesting, is, is can zoning be practiced as more of a science? So is there, is there some, you know, I think we, you know, a lot of the discussion talks about, you know, what's the rational basis for zoning and, you know, what is the rational, you know, use of different land. So what is, you know, what does that mean? Is there any, is there any work that's been done, any thinking that's been done sort of legally or, you know, otherwise, or just even ideas about what, what might it take to, to make that kind of zoning decision making about where to draw boundaries and everything more, more scientific? I have a question of my own back, which is, has, has Cambridge ever had flirtation with sort of form-based code or anything like that? Um, so let me, let me step back. So the reason I'm responding like this um, is, you know, zoning is law. <laughs> um, law is sort of a science, but really more, you know, it's, a, it's obviously a very specialized language. Um, and one of the sometimes criticisms of zoning is it's really hard to sort of affirmatively structure when you're trying to speak in the language of law about what's prohibited and what's permitted. And so um, there is a sort of emerging movement in land use um, toward something called form-based code um, that is a little bit more written in the language of planning and architecture um, and has sort of community input um, as a part of the process that yields the form-based code. And it's sort of a shift from the language of law uh, toward uh, a language or uh, visual uh, depictions perhaps um, from architecture and a lot of cities are sort of experimenting with or thinking about form-based code. I don't know that it makes it more scientific but it changes the science um, and you know there's debates I think about which of these is more inclusive for the public considering that sometimes the legal restrictions can be really hard to understand or can get quite technical it can be easier to interact with pictures. Um, again I don't think I don't think Cambridge has had as much experience with that but I moved up here from Charlottesville, um, Virginia, where um, they were experimenting at the time with form-based code, and it brought out a lot of interesting, um, both opponents uh, who were scared about loss of, you know, the traditional ways they had leverage in the zoning system, um, and also, like, worries about, um, you know, the shift in language and who would end up being privileged or able to speak. So I would say, I mean, in, in like, I, I think for early zoning advocates, they did think it was, like, a science, that it was gonna be pursuant to planning, they could, it was gonna be pretty static, you could predict future growth and then you could zone uh, in a way that planned for future growth, but they were Pollyannish about this. I mean, they were, the idea that you could actually like predict future growth far out of the future is just kind of unrealistic. Uh, and so that's problematic. There has been also, you know, there's been more written about it, I think, than actually done in terms of what's called performance zoning, where you try to kind of like 
measure the impact of certain things. Um, so maybe that would be more scientific. Uh, I mean, in some ways, we're, it's like a second best way to get a certain thing. So like, if our concern is the noises from labs, like, we could regulate the noise, right? Like, we could, we could have regulation that's more tied to the negative adverse effect we perceive, but we try to use zoning as like a blunt instrument to get at a lot of things that we could maybe get more directly at through regulation. Uh, there's also some people who talk about using like, sensors throughout urban areas to like measure permissible uses in a way that might then translate into legal standards, but how you would do that up front, I don't really know. Yeah. Strikes me as fundamentally a political challenge more than a scientific challenge is getting like the zoning that we need. And I've been fascinated by the MBTA community zoning law because uh, this uh, it was a law that the state adopted a few years ago saying that cities and towns served by the MBTA um, need to zone for a reasonable area for multifamily housing as of right. And then the state set certain performance standards for like what's a reasonable area. Um, and the way that the state structured that, they gave cities and towns a lot of flexibility of like where they would put the district and how if they cover a large area with sort of relatively low density multifamily housing or a small area with like towers and, or zone for towers. Um, Cambridge, by the way, I think came into compliance just with your existing zoning that you allowed enough multifamily housing as of right in walking distance from train stations to already be in compliance without changing your zoning, which is rare. Most cities and towns didn't have the zoning in place to comply and needed to do it. Um, I was, it's been very exciting to see people coming to the table, not just for like a planning exercise to create a plan that sits on the shelf and that I read one doing a research study, but like actually thinking through like, if we're gonna zone for multifamily housing, where is it gonna go? Like, let's start talking parcel by parcel, how high like to actually do the zoning and to see that in a lot of places. Still, a lot of places are kind of gaming the system and coming into compliance in a paper way or like allowing a very minimal amount of multifamily housing. I'm worried on the other end of this after like millions spent to you know, reform zoning, we're not gonna get that much more housing by it. But what strikes me when you talk about science, like it's not science, but like I could walk through a lot of downtown areas and be like, that's a good parcel for more you know, density. That sort of a hidden parcel over there could get six stories, no problem. That one, that one. Um, I think that any community, if they were like coming to the table in good faith saying the region needs more multifamily housing, where do we put it? Every community can find places for it. I think it's like a political challenge that um, while there's a growing pro-housing movement, that's still a lot of motivation in a lot of places to like be exclusionary, and so uh, overcoming those politics can be a really like hard challenge. Um, I'll, I'll ask a related question that came in, which is about I think this is kind of it maybe is a little bit of a of a tangent from the comments you were just making. Um, there's a question about how zoning can address different and often competing or conflicting community priorities. So if you go back, you know, we, you know, we, as we were talking in, um, in the, you know, 19, or the, in the seventies, as communities were getting more restrictive with zoning and that was having an impact on housing, the state was coming in saying, we need to, you know, we need to make, you know, that an explicit goal is trying to promote more, more affordable housing. And you have things like, you know, chapter 40 B, which we haven't really talked about, but you have other, other actions taken at the state level. How, how does that, um, you know, how does that play into this conversation about what, what zoning is for and how to practice zoning? That's, that's the, it's hard to phrase as a question, but like what are, you know, what are the ways that zoning can and has been used to try to find some kind of balance between those different competing priorities? I'm not sure you start with the zoning. Um, you sort of start with uh, um, a discussion uh, amongst uh, official city and uh, citizen city uh, in a planning process uh, and um, through a lot of interaction uh, and discussion um, over time, uh, I think you can come to some consensus on what you want to do and what's desirable for uh, any particular location or uh, for the city as a whole. Um, 
And I, I know midway in my uh, tenure at the city, there was a lot of complaining from citizens that we, we, we weren't expressing what our objections were citywide. Where were we going with the zoning we were changing? Uh, and what were we going to be doing in the future? Uh, and we, as a result of that complaint, we developed a, a, a sort of a policy plan which laid out what were our, our objectives and what those, ob uh, how those objectives would be reflected in the regulations that we would ultimately adopt. Um, uh, so, um, I'm not sure where I'm going here. <laughs> but I but think, I think that policy plan was uh, an excellent description of what the city wanted to happen in the future. And uh, I think zoning subsequent to that in many ways has reflected those policy objectives in uh, precise regulation of the land use. So I, I think if you're if you're going to um, balance competing needs, you have to do it at a high level. So you have to do it at the level of planning and rezoning. The problem that we have in many cities, in, in Boston, where I live and, and work, is a prime example of this, is we have a 3,600-page zoning code with 450 districts, and we build nothing as of right. So it's a somewhat worthless piece of paper. Instead, we have community meetings on a Tuesday night where everybody fights over whether they want a new development. We grant over 1,000 variances a year. So if you're going to have a complex code, Ideally, that complex code would be predicated on lengthy community input, but then you shouldn't be having community input to the level we have it at the point of every project because you're just undermining whatever you did in the code, which in theory was taking into account all these voices, which are not going to show up every Tuesday night. So I think we need to have zoning codes that allow as of right development that reflects the community's needs if we want to reflect the community needs. And perhaps it sounds ironic, not allow the community to have input on every single project because inevitably the community that have the most impact and the most effect are the most powerful ones. Yeah. Okay. But that's probably controversial, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's late. <laughs> Amy? So one of the things I think about in terms of balancing different interests is like historic preservation. And then there are some like pro-housing advocates who are saying like historic preservation just like gets used by people who oppose housing to not let any more in. But I feel like if people were coming to the table and like really wanting more housing in their communities and trying to find places, like there's not a conflict there between historic preservation. They're, like there are plenty of properties in all of our communities that like don't really need historic preservation. And that if we were like coming to the table knowing like in Watertown, for its MBTA community zoning, like decided like there were a couple of criteria in figuring out the districts for multifamily housing to be allowed as of right. And one was like, let's protect the properties that have historic buildings and not include them in the MBTA community's district. And let's be sort of careful about where there are existing residential neighborhoods where people politically are gonna feel anxious about taller buildings going in like right next to them. Um, and so they had those two criteria and then walked around their downtown area and like found a whole lot of parcels that weren't next to like existing single family homes and didn't have historic buildings. And, and Rizzo, and like they're in the process. They haven't like finally like passed the plan, but they um, are almost there. Um, and I think that that is like really doable and that like Winchester went through a process at one point where it's just like they came up with that criteria. Let's not zone for really dense housing where there are historic buildings. Or you can have like zoning that allows very dense building with historic preservation. You know, you if you have a historic building, you got to keep that in order to get the extra units um, and you can put that into the zoning. Um, so I think that there are, there are a lot of ways to balance these needs if we like really embrace all of the different agendas. The f so thanks. thanks for setting, setting uh -huh. up for the uh, historic preservation question. <laughs> uh, um, in Cambridge has actually been pretty progressive, I think, in, in that respect, and my predecessors at the commission, and I do have predecessors, I haven't <laughs> been there forever, um, uh, set up the commission to do a survey of every single building in Cambridge, all 13,000 plus 
minus, and nobody's quite sure how many there are. Um, so that, that gave us an intellectual basis to have a fairly fine-grained approach to planning and preservation. And so my approach as a planner has been that you know, architectural quality and neighborhood character is a variable like uh, transportation or clean air or light and air uh, and, and the like. And it's, it's just another planning a factor that needs to be taken into account in planning the future of a, of a community. Um, Les and I uh, made, I think, some important strides in the, when doing the overlay districts in Central Square and Harvard Square and Upper Mass Ave, where we were able to prioritize, uh, just slightly uh, incentivize preservation of contributing buildings in those National Register districts, um, and built that into the zoning, um, which um, I think is, not been as effective as we might have hoped. You know, those, those non-contributing buildings that we hoped would be snapped up by developers um, are still sitting out there, not contributing much to the, to the urban fabric. <laughs> but um, we'll see. I mean, you have to take a long view in, in this. Um, so thank you. The frustrating thing is uh, details matter and design matters, quality matters. Um, and <laughs> the way we get that is by imposing a process, a special permit process before the planning board, something like that. That's, uh, it would be wonderful if we didn't have to do that. But just saying the building is 40 feet high and a certain FAR and whatever other parameter that you want to impose doesn't guarantee that you're going to get a good result. Um, uh, and, you know, I, over time we've um, tricked people into coming to us to uh, get permission to do development. Uh, you know, we, we rezone so that you get an as of right development, but it isn't very much. But we'll give you a lot more if you come and talk to us. Um, and generally that's worked out well. I, we do have contentious public hearings, uh, but I think our, our boards have been uh, particularly amenable to uh, cooperating with uh, private property owners and developers specifically. Um, to get the best result for them and for the city. Uh, but it's, it's um, a difficult balance to uh, take. Uh, it is unfair to force people to go through a, a process where you get angry uh, uh, people coming into a public hearing demanding uh, non-approval of something. I think our boards have been uh, willing to resist that uh, temptation uh, for the most part. Yeah, and the results have been very positive for the city. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to even inform base zoning, uh, be sufficiently precise when to get something that you want. Uh, and very often it, what you want is hard to predict until you see what's proposed. <laughs> uh, so yeah, they were all compromised in some fashion. Well, I, I think we're gonna have to leave it there. We're about at time. So um, I just wanted to close uh, with a, a few thank yous. First of all, thank you to the panel. And if we could all give them another round of applause. <laughs> great. Whoops. And I had a list of thank yous too. So I'm gonna, uh, sorry, I messed that up. Um, I did. Um, I want to thank again my just my staff, and I'll, I'll point them out. So Daniel and uh, Teal, who helped run the questions up. Grant and Mary Lou, I mentioned our interns. Uh, Mason is there. Mason and Daniel are going to be going parental leave very soon. So um, congratulations to them. Um, Evan uh, is over there. Swathi over by the door. She really is responsible for for making this whole event happen and getting all set up. So let's have a round of applause for Swathi. For being there. Um, 
and our, and our newest team member, Sophie, also helped quite a bit on, on that. Um, a few, yeah, let's hear from Sophie. Um, I want to thank the, the library staff, so um, Zachary Bond and Serena White um, for helping us do all the setup and, and all the staff here. Um, Colin Stevens at, at IT, who's really put a lot of work into helping make sure this, this gets pulled off. Um, Calvin Lindsay and the whole um, City View 22 team. We're on TV, did you know that? Um, uh, Annie Sean in the communications. Um, Kay Nguli, who's our uh, graphics intern, who ju really just started, but um, you know, designed the flyers for this and has been taking photographs of everything, which is has really been great. Um, Katie Grillo in the GIS department really has helped put, put together all the um, story maps that you've seen part of, um, uh, along with Brendan Monroe, uh, the Historical Commission, mainly Charlie and Sarah Burke, so I think is, is over here, um, has put a lot of, of uh, work into helping us with the story maps, all the historical information. Um, the, the audience here, I mean, I thank you all for coming. This is really, um, oddly, this is a thrill of, of a career for me to do an event like this. I've been, been waiting for it for a long time. And I wanted to thank, I, I see that maybe she snuck out a little bit early, but Iram Farouk, the Assistant City Manager for Community Development, really for, for letting us do this. And she was sitting right next to Beth Rubenstein, the former Assistant City Manager, who was there, who was the City Manager, uh, Assistant City Manager when I started working for the city. Um, so thank all of you very much. Give yourselves a round of applause. And, um, and please join us uh, in the hallway for some refreshments and um, chat with us, chat with the panel, chat with each other, and I hope you, you all learned something. Thanks.